Why Christians should care about politics. Pew Research did a study in 2023 and brought us some very helpful statistics about politics. 65% of Americans, they say, always or often feel exhausted when thinking or talking about politics. Does that sound accurate to you? How many of you would say when you think about politics or maybe have a discussion, uh, we could say American politics, it, uh, it has a level of exhaustion to it. Can we, get, can we get a show of hands here? All right. And the rest of you are just too exhausted to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to get it. Um, most people's view of politics is negative when we think about our elected officials. It can be negative, the way people talk about politicians. And I think in today's culture, there's little hope for improvement in the conversations that I'm in or in the things that I'm watching and reading. And part of the reason, let's just admit it, is that our political system is dominated by things that we do not understand. Special interests, billions of dollars being flooded into campaigns and partisan warfare that just doesn't even make sense anymore, at least as far as I can tell. And we have widespread criticism of all three branches of the government, both political parties, all politicians, and today, of course, especially the candidates that are put before us federally and uh, locally. I don't know if you guys voted for the local elections for Washington state, but I don't think in my lifetime, at least, which isn't as long as some of you, I have ever seen this many people up for governor. <laughs> and uh, that good space guy, man, he is going for it, isn't it? He? he is... <laughs> He is not caring at all. Um, and if you uh, don't know what I'm talking about, you either didn't vote or you didn't read the pamphlet. Because there is a guy in there that his name is Good Space Guy, and he wants to be governor of Washington State. And it made me think, Good Space Guy, it made me think that I could apply. <laughs> I didn't say I'd win. I just thought I ought to throw my hat in the ring, you know, just see what happens. Um, good pastor guy. I don't, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's, it's a little bit of a circus. It's a little strange. It's a little weird. Doesn't feel respectable like it should. Doesn't feel like the honor that it is to lead people and to advocate for things that matter. Politics, it just seems odd. Like something is wrong because something actually is wrong. In 2023, Pew Research provided more statistics here. 63% of US adults say they don't have any confidence in the future of our political system. Only 16% said that they trust the federal government most of the time. And that's a historic low. They've been tracking for a long time. 28% were unfavorable or express unfavorable views of both political parties, and that's growing. There are a lot of predictions that say this two-party system is separating to the point where something's going to emerge in the middle, perhaps. I don't know that it can happen financially, but it seems like if you track, it's like these two parties are going farther and farther, and the middle is opening up. Isn't that kind of what it seems like? And uh, whether or not that can happen, I don't know. 25% don't feel well represented by their party, even though they're part of one. 63% say they are dissatisfied with the candidates who have emerged for president and other races. And I myself am part of the 63%. Uh, percent. There is more, but I think that you get the point. All of this is just simply saying that exhaustion is real. And there's a reason that people feel this way. But here's the question today. Should Christians back out of the political arena because it's difficult and it's complex? Should Christians back out? My answer is this. My answer is no. I think that we shouldn't. And with the rest of our time, I would like to present to you uh, two things that I think are important as to why Christians should care about politics. And the first is what are politics? And the second is why do why does it matter? Why did they matter? So the first question, what, uh, let's just talk about what politics are. Politics is the practice of organizing and regulating society or people's lives under the legal authority of the land. Politics are the rules and the laws agreed upon through the political process of any given body of people. That's simple. And a government is the system of order for a nation or a state responsible 
for enforcing those politics or those laws and those rules throughout society. Now, we have a biblical precedent to think through and care about politics. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, this is where God created man and he said, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And so when God called humans to be fruitful and exercise dominion over creation, he was giving them instructions for ordering a future of people around the purpose of cultivating his creation for flourishing. In a sense, this is very political. God gave that organization. If you look at Exodus through Deuteronomy, mostly Exodus and Leviticus, this is where God gave Israel his law before they went into the promised land. And the law was not just some spiritual thing, but it carried political implications for ordering a society around his truth. Politics is the organizing of a society. It's the rules and the laws of society. God gave his law to his people. They had been under Egypt. They had been, been under their religion, under their law, under their rule, under their politics. They came out from under that and they had no idea how to rule a society. They had no structure. They had no system. They didn't know what to do, but they're going into a new land. And if you actually read closely Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you'll find that God was actually giving them an ordering system for the new society that he was bringing them into, into a new land. And so these laws were very specific. I bet you that when you and I read sometimes Leviticus, it's very uncomfortable. We read Exodus and it doesn't make sense. And you look at how specific God was in his laws and the things he said, do, do, I want you to do this and I want you to not do this. And today, some of that doesn't relate to us because it's, it's not universal law. I won't go into to that specifically. There's, there's a whole host of reasons why we need to dissect the, the law of God as to what is applicable today. But this is what God was giving. He was giving them a political structure in, in a sense. And you might remember that as they get into the land, the people disobey the law. They disobey God, left and right and everything in between. They just don't follow God. And so there comes a point where the people cry out for what? They go, we want you to give us a, a king like the other nations. Give us a structure where we can look at someone and follow them. And God says to them, you might remember this, you read Kings, you haven't brushed up on it in a while. First, second Kings, first, second Chronicles. It's good reading. God says, if I give you a king, you will not like it. And it will come at great cost. And they said, we don't care. Give us a king. That's the B-I-V. All right. That's <laughs> Ben's International Version. We don't care. Give us a king. We want a king. And he says, I will give it to you. It's going to cost you. And friends, it did. And if you read Israel's history, hardly any of their kings, hardly any, we'll talk about a few that were different than this, but hardly any of them ruled the people righteously. In fact, it says as a summation of their life, so-and-so did evil in the eyes of the Lord. How would you like that on your tombstone? <laughs> so-and-so bent, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, that's the summation of your whole life. Evil, you were an evil ruler and rulers, kings were judged harshly because they were called to care for God's people. And so they were, they were judged in, in such a way. And so there have been many forms of government throughout human history as, as we know. And that is a biblical conundrum for us. And here's, here's why. Jesus and the apostles, they lived under a very different form of government than we have today. Rome started as a monarchy, which is like a head of state and a family was in charge. It supposedly, history tells us, became a representative democracy, but it functioned more like an oligarchy, which is where aristocrats are in charge. And through civil war, it ended as an empire. And if you read the beginning of the gospel, it says Caesar Augustus was over the land at that time. Augustus is exalted one. He had that, that title. And so you can see the religious spirit and the political spirit were like tied together, um, even throughout the time of, of the gospel. And people will, will say this, but it's very important that during the time of Rome, when you were to say Jesus is Lord, that was a political statement because to the Roman Caesar was Lord. And so these, are, when you think about Jesus wasn't political, in fact, he was absolutely countercultural and saying things about Jesus and following a leader with a new ordering system of a new kingdom had political implications to it for sure. 
But our conundrum is that we, we in the United States, we're not under a monarchy. We're not under some kind of oligarchy. We're not some empire or anything like that. The USA is often categorized as a democracy. And before you try to rebuke me, because <laughs> some of you will, and, you will, and I, it's happened, and I just do it kindly, uh, some would more accurately define our governmental system as a constitutional, constitutional federal republic or republic. Essentially, what this means in the United States is that we are a society governed by the people for the people, in theory. And even though we elect officials, we elect officials of the people. Case in point, good space guy could be our governor. He's one of the people, we can elect him, and he's called to represent the people, govern the people as a representative of the people. So it's the people leading the people. That, in a sense, is sort of what we are supposed to be. And this provides us in our country with unique opportunities that they did not have in biblical times. We can vote, we can push back evil, we can run for office, and we can debate ideas publicly and openly. And that was not always the case Um, in their times. And so Christians, in my view, should care about politics because it affects people. And today we have more opportunities. Let me, let me prove this to you. Okay. Cause you think I'm getting political. You're like, Ben, where are we going? This is, this is, I've, I've had a change of mind over the last six years, simply because as I've read more and I've looked into this, I've started to understand the practical nature of this. I don't think we should be politicized. I don't think we should be polarized, but I think we should care about politics. Let me give you an example. How many of you, well, let's just take a guess. In Washington state, all of the, those that are part of the legislature that put forth bills. So all the lawmakers in in Washington state, how many bills in 2024, eight months, how many bills do you think that had been written with intention to go to the governor's office and be signed? I'm not, I'm not asking how many were signed. I'm not asking how many the governor saw. I'm asking you, how many bills do you think in Washington state in eight months were actually written with the intention that the governor would sign them? How many do you think? Let's go ahead. 500. How many? Thousand. 500. Okay, so we're in the hundreds. Some of you are like, I don't know. Not sure. Okay, so it's way over a thousand. Way over a thousand. Okay, these are bills. These are laws. Laws affect people, right? Okay, so what are these bills about? I, ca- I categorically summarize them for you. You're welcome. These bills include education, child care, housing, public safety, climate, labor and industry, building codes. There was a ban on child marriage that was signed by Jay Inslee. Thank you, Jay. And a bill against octopus farming. And a, just to bring this up, because I've talked about sexuality a number of times from our stage, m- there, were, there were more bills concerning LGBTQ people in Washington state than I could count, w- w- way more than I could count. So this is an interesting thing. Bills represent values and these bills affect, some of them can affect our daily lives. And most people have no idea what's even being written and sent to the governor's office. That's the truth. Our, according to Statista research in 2022, it reveals that our governmental system in terms of, uh, we're dominated by a two-party system, Republican and Democrat. And it shows us that we're basically split down the middle. So if I were to show you the graph or the diagram, it actually shows you that every year it goes a little Democrat and then it goes a little Republican and then it goes a little Democrat and it goes a little Republican. And we're literally in the country, we're split pretty much down the middle. It goes up and down, up and down. And it seems like the balance of power kind of goes back and forth. That's, that's what it has looked like for the last number of years. That's why you'll see a Democrat in office federally as the president, and then you'll see a Republican and then a Democrat. Yeah, it's never been fully dominated. It has for some seasons, but this is the balance of power that we have. But we have this two-party system that dominates our governmental structure, at least at this 
um, at this time. And these parties represent a very different vision for the United States. And I know because I decided to read the party platforms in 2020, which I had never done before. I had never read the document of the Republican Party, and I had never read the document of the Democratic Party. And I decided that if I was going to ever talk about it with anybody, because some of you were confronting me on a number of things, and I love you, but I was like, you know what? I've never read these, so I'm going to read them. So I read them. I don't know if you've ever done it. I don't know if you've ever read every word of them, but I did. And they're a very different vision for the country. And I encourage you to, uh, to read them so that you are knowledgeable about this because you can just pull them up on, online. But even though we have a dominated two-party system, here's the question that I have. I read them and, uh, and I, I have my vision and values based on scripture. I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating for anything today per se there. I mean, but I'll talk honestly. My question is, regardless of where you land, whether you consider yourself a moderate or left or right or, or wherever, conservative, liberal, is it okay that Christians find themselves in the same kind of divisive spirit with the same kind of behavior that is often exhibited in the world? And here's my question. Can you have convictions? Can you believe the truth? Can you stand on what you believe? Can you articulate it lovingly, honestly, straightforwardly, without flinching, without being afraid? That's what's so great about our country. You can say what you believe without fear. Yes, some people might have a visceral reaction. It is what it is. But you and I know we have laws that protect us, at least today, that we can share what we believe without, without fear. Not that you have to all the time, but I'm just, that's the beauty of, of this. But my question is, should we be like the world in the way that we communicate about the things that we believe, namely in this conversation, politics? Should we? You think so? Or should we be different? Should we be able to have convictions, have our politics, and still be, um, make a point without making an enemy? Okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right now. Are you ready? Some of you aren't ready. Okay. I, my personal politics, I would, I would call myself a biblical moral conservative. That's what I call myself. You can call yourself whatever you want. But I'm just being authentic and honest. Since you're listening to me, I don't want you to guess. I call myself a biblical moral conservative. So when I read policies, when I listen to politicians, and when I look at parties, my filter is what are they saying? How are they conveying what they're saying? What do they believe? What are they standing on? Th these are the ways that I look at, at politics. It's not difficult for me. However, I've got friends all over the place and I'm genuinely friends with them. So when I hear people say things like, you can't be a Democrat and a Christian, I cringe. Like guys, I cringe so hard. I wonder what kind of Christianity that person has. Yeah, I said it. I do. Because you know what we've done? We have literally made our politics our Bible. The Constitution is our Bible, and we wrap the American flag around the Bible. That, listen, that is crazy. You can have your convictions, but you can't judge someone's salvation on their politics. It's nuts. I'm going to say it louder. It's nuts. And I know, I talk to people and they're, that are over 60, and if you're in the room, I love you, I'm on my way to you. <laughs> but if you're over 60 and you ever have a conversation with a young person, you wonder what's so different, you grew up in a different world. You grew up, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I remember when we stopped doing that. I was in school. Just one day, it didn't happen anymore. But you grew up, I pledge allegiance to the flag. You remember the Bible being okay. Some of you had the 10 commandments. If you lived in the South, you had more than the 10 commandments on the public school wall. And so you're, you feel like you're losing the world that had, had, was somewhat Christianized to you. The Judeo-Christian value system was there and you feel like we're losing that. But the young people are growing up, they never knew that. So there's a huge gap in our communication. And I would say both young and old have a lot to learn from each other as we live in a secular time. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people and they don't listen at all. They do not listen. They just want people to parrot what they say. And friends, we're not gonna win the world over simply by our politics. Now, 
Ben, you're saying politics matter. They do, but they're not of eternal significance in the way that some people treat them. It does matter the way we treat each other. It matters the laws that we pass. We want to care for and love each other. All that stuff is true. But friends, the church's intention, because we have a higher, a transcendent calling and truth. And we have to be very careful the way that we steward our politics. Now, I'm open about being a conservative, not because I'm proud about it and I want you to be. I might want you to be. (laughs) But I've got a lot of friends and I've had many in our church reach out to me and say they don't feel the same way. And that's fine. And they're still my friends. And I wonder if if others who who grieve like I do have have friends across the aisle. I don't know. I, I think often they don't. I think often they're not in conversations with anybody that differs from them, which if you kind of translate this into a spiritual conversation for a second, where's that going? See the divide. All right. I'll talk more about this in the future, but let's talk about why politics matter to Christians. Four reasons. Are you ready? Okay. It's going to be like, number one, politics matter to Christians because we have a biblical worldview, which affects how we see everything. A common objection to Christians being involved in politics is we should be solely focused on mission. And it's true. Evangelism and discipleship are the foundation and the focus of Christianity. Amen. I'm not changing that. That is the focus of our church. That is what I preach. And I'm not saying that the political arena is how we fulfill Christian mission. Jesus didn't say that. I'm not saying that. However, I'm not discluding the political arena as part of how it is that we can love neighbor and and serve others. A biblical worldview provides a comprehensive understanding of all reality because everything belongs to God. There's no separation to God. He's going to judge the living and the dead. The books are going to be open. He's going to judge us based on what we said and how we lived. And it isn't going to matter the party that you were in or the things, the politics that you had per se. But at the end of the day, everything belongs to God. This is what Psalm 24 says in verse one, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Our worldview as Christians informs every area of life. And that means we can't just separate politics and be like, well, we don't want to talk about that. And some of our families, you can't talk about religion or politics. And I think that's sad. I think that's sad. It might be your reality, but it is sad. It is sad that that's, that's our reality. But the fact is, is that we should be able to do so freely and, um, because we have a biblical worldview and it affects what we think about everything. Scripture talks a lot about civil government and it instructs us how to be faithful in our relationship to it. In the Old Testament, Joseph and Daniel served in civil government and influenced national leaders with their godly perspective, even though the nations that they were a part of were ungodly. And if we're so partisan, if people are so partisan that they can't even talk to people from another party, they will never be a prophetic witness in the midst of leaders of any kind that have a different view. How would Joseph and Daniel be able to speak to the national leaders who literally were like part of an occult at that point? How would that even be possible? In the New Testament, Jesus's ministry was caring for the spiritual and physical needs of people, which was the outworking of the gospel. Now, politics cannot save individuals, but it is a vehicle to stop injustice from taking further root in our society. And Paul advocated several things that I want to bring up. The first is in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. He says, so then while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This idea of doing good is on an individual level. We should love, we should bless, we should be generous, we should be kind, we should share the gospel, all of that. We should help the poor individually, person to person, we should be doing that. Whether you are or aren't right now, here's an encouragement. We should be doing that. However, politically is more of the macro. There's micro and there's macro. And I think doing good could include what we advocate for on a political level. And that's why I think it's important. And when we look at scripture, we can include it. Ephesians chapter two and verse 10, it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now you might not be part of the political process, but there are people even in our congregation that feel called that God has put them in a place to advocate 
for the greater culture and the greater good. And this is a good work that God has put in their heart to do. And for us, we just need to know that some things that God has called us to do affects the micro. That's everybody, but some we're called to affect change on a macro level to the degree that, that we can. And that's why politics can be important. Decisions made by government have serious impact on people and the way that we interact with each other. And a biblical worldview should include doing good to others, which has these political implications. All right, number two, we are commanded to love our neighbor, which affects how we treat everyone. When Jesus was questioned by the religious authorities on the law about the greatest commandment, he said this in Matthew 22, verse 37. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. This is the great and foremost commandment. And then the second is like it. And now he quotes from Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan to illustrate this very principle. And it's irrespective of race and background and social status or occupation. Loving neighbor is the call and the way of Jesus. Now, again, how do we do that? We do that on individual levels. We should be caring about and caring for everyone that's in our view in the way that God has, has called us to or provided opportunity for us to do so. But I would also say that politics are an important arena in which Christian love can be promoted and demonstrated. You could ask this question, how can we claim love for neighbor and not engage what shapes basic rights and freedoms for other people? How can we claim true love? Now, I have to say this too, because people will say amen to this point, but I have seen a lot of folks who get somewhat passionate about the political process and they leave behind caring for people on an individual level. Like you look at their life, I'm just being honest here, and you're not compelled by their Christian witness. And their passion for politics, as great as that might be, and as much love that that can show on a macro level in terms of laws and all that, it's important, we can't lose the fact that we are called to be people that love neighbor on an individual and a practical level. And we can't hide behind our passionate rhetoric for the truth. I mean, I wanna stand for the truth, but you can't hide behind I'm a person of truth and really be a cringy, mean person. You're gonna be judged for that. And, and there's so many people today, it's like, we stand on the truth, but you are mean as it gets. And your behavior and not just your belief is going to be in view, right? We're gonna stand before Jesus with what we believe, what we said and how we lived, how we lived, not just how we voted, not just what laws we advocated for. And so in our passion for politics, we better be careful that we don't cloud over the reality of what our heart and life is really like in the name of truth. Loving our neighbor must look like something. And I'm saying it can include how we look at, at politics, but we can't be people that advocate for right and righteous laws and are just mean spirited people. It is shameful, isn't it? It's shameful. I mean, I'm unashamedly pro-life, but I cannot tell you how many times I've seen pro-life advocates do cringy things even in the name of Jesus. And it is shameful what they do and what they say. And they misinterpret this book all the time. I stand for life. I've told you my story. We support these organizations. We can do that without being the opposite of the character of Jesus. And we must, yeah. we must. In today's world of polarization, we must make the difference, not just in how we vote, but also, and most importantly, how we live. It must be that way. And I think that we at the, ch the church will probably be and will be the last beacon of hope to show the world how it's done, that we can differ on things. And we do. And I bet you some of you differ with me and I'm right. And it's okay that you're wrong. It's fine. <laughs> and I'm passionate about that. I'm passionate about your being wrong and my being right. And it's fine. And I still love you. <laughs> Tell my kids that all the time. <laughs> In Matthew 25 and verse 40, Jesus shares the importance of caring for the hungry, the naked, the sick, the lonely, and the imprisoned. It's important to Jesus. We should serve people 
on an individual level. But when I talk about advocating politically, that's what we're doing. Hopefully, the laws that we seek to pass and to advocate are the ones that care about people, the ones that care about people. Good government and good laws um, are not negligible factors in the prosperity and the freedom of a society. Here's a great example in case you're, you're struggling with this. You have Korea. People in North Korea are held in economic bondage by corrupt political leaders and systems. They're not the only country, but they certainly are one that we know of. And the people of South Korea are given freedom through leader systems that encourage flourishing. Which, which one do you think is better? And I have a friend that's from North Korea and he lives here now and he runs a YWAM base. And he's one of the few people that I know that can actually go into North Korea longer than the five to 10 days that they allow you to do so. And there are plenty of people in North Korea that, that don't think the regime that they're under is, is that bad. And they've, they've been taught that or whatever. But friends, there are a lot of people. They're under this bondage of government. And I can tell you, when, when, when people understand what's happening, they want a different government. They want different laws. It matters then. And I think sometimes we don't, we don't think about it this way, but, but that's the reality. So obedience to Jesus's command of loving neighbor as self, I'm just saying that it could and should include advocating laws that protect the unborn children, strengthen families, care for the vulnerable, provide opportunity for people, all people to flourish. Politics are a way of bringing great change and I think can be seen in a way to love our neighbor. I'm not saying that's the full interpretation of that. I'm just saying it could be part of how we see it. Number three, we are called to love our city and build a better future for the next generation. You might remember this story but when Israel was brought into captivity, they were being judged and they were brought into captivity in Babylon. They naturally wanted to resist and fight for their freedom. And the prophet Jeremiah was raised up by God and he actually told Israel, don't fight back. This is going to happen. And some very dumb people decided that they were gonna fight back. But this was the judgment of God for the behavior of the people. And Jeremiah said, don't do it. They did it. And it, cra- it, it came at great cost to those that did. And then when they settled into the land, Jeremiah wrote them a letter. And we usually read Jeremiah 29, 11, and we miss the rest of the text, but he wrote them a letter and he told the people how to live in, in the land for the next 70 years that they were gonna be, be there. Jeremiah 29, verse four, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I want you to build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Did you catch that? I want you to chill out. You're not going anywhere. I know you long for different, but this is your reality. And so I want you to build houses, live there. I want you to plant gardens and eat what you produce. I want you to build family and legacy, even in the midst of where you are. And I want you to seek the welfare of the city. I want you to seek the welfare of the people that you don't agree with. I want you to pray for their welfare. And I want you to know there's a promise. If you do that, I will bless you even as they are blessed. Look at God saying to his people, I want you to be concerned with the people that you don't even like. I want you to be concerned. I want you to pray for them. And this of course reminds us of several other New Testament passages that say the exact same thing. If we translate this for today, this is one reason why we can't be so radically partisan. Because if we are, I guarantee you what we will not do is pray for people that we disagree with politically. And I don't need a show of hands, I just know. One time, I literally when President Biden became our president, we had a prayer meeting that night. And I, st- I said, hey, we're gonna pray for President Biden. He is my president. We're gonna pray for President Biden. I don't make fun of him. I don't talk about his mental health and his decline. I think that's just mean-spirited for Christian people. I understand the world doing it. I do not understand Christians talking like that. I just, I just don't. And I have opinions that I'm gonna leave them out as to why I think we've gotten there. But we, I started to pray and I said, we're gonna, we're gonna pray for President Biden. And people walked out. Yeah. And you could hear it like over the, con- I was like, oh. I was like, look, that is not the church. 
that I'm going to lead. I'm not going to lead that. That's unchristian, right? It's crazy. It's crazy. Oh my gosh. I love you guys, but that's, I, I just, I don't even, I can, listen, I don't even know where to start and stop if I open this book to show you that, but you know, you know that if Jesus was, was here, Jesus, I mean, President Biden's not my enemy, of course, but I mean, Jesus even taught us to go that far. And I'm like, come on. Like, all right. We're called to care for the people of our city. The people of our city should know Christians care, even if we have differences. I've taken plenty of hits for me being very clear on issues. Okay, I have. But the fact is, is I think you can make a point without making an enemy. And I think we can do this differently. And if persecution came for a person having beliefs in scripture, at least it doesn't come because I'm a jerk. You can say amen anytime you want. All right. (laughs) I said me. I didn't say you. I tried to like, you know, help you out, give you a real good uppercut, but. All right, lastly, and you can breathe. Number four, our political participation brings righteous accountability to our government. And this really matters to me a lot. And I believe it does to you. We must remember that all governments derive their authority from God. It's delegated, it's borrowed. God has power and authority over the entire earth. In Romans chapter 13, the apostle Paul wrote that Christians should submit to the governing authorities. And sometimes that gets translated that we should just sit down, buckle up, shut up. We don't have a say, but we live in a different form of government where we actually do have a say and we can vote and we can push back and we can say that that's evil. But Paul tells us what government is supposed to be for. And he said it way back then when it certainly wasn't. He said, government is called to promote peace and good behavior for the welfare of the city. Government is called to punish evil and through laws and punishment, warn those who do evil. Government is called to promote life, peace, and prosperity within a society so that all people can flourish. So the question is, do all governments and governing leaders steward their authority this way? And the answer is no. And praise God that in this, at this time and in this country right now, when that is not the case, we can push back and say, this is wrong. And I'm thankful that we can do that. And if we're not engaged, if the church just pulls out, if Christians pull out, then what we are doing is we are allowing whoever's values that cares the most to be the laws of the land. And I just want to know if you're okay with that. If we pull out, then we're allowing whoever speaks the loudest with whatever values they have to become the laws of our land. And that scares me. And so I've had a change of heart over the last six years. And that doesn't mean that I'm gonna set up a registration booth in the lobby. Don't ask, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Most of that's done online now, but just don't, don't ask. I know some of you are passionate about it and you really want that to happen, it's not gonna happen. And don't pass out leaflets here. Don't pass out pamphlets. I love you, but don't do that. Everything that's political needs to go to the pastors and the elders, and we will pray about what we do together as a church. Knock yourself out with your own friend groups. Amen? That's you. That's your life. I don't control your life. I won't try to control your life. I can't control my kids' lives. (laughs) But as a church, this is the church, and there's delegated authority to the pastors and leaders. So if we're going to do something political, we're going to do it together. Can you ask me to do stuff? And many of you do? Sure. But I can say no, because I don't sense that we are supposed to take on everything as a church. There are some things that we might, but most things that we won't. And I'm going to have a podcast coming to a church near you in the future. There's a lot of things that you get passionate. Some of us get passionate. Oh, Pastor Ben, we need to care about this. And I look at the law and I look at the bill and I'm like, nope, this isn't one the church is going to take on. And you could say, well, you don't care about politics. Nope, that's not true. I appreciate your passion. And there are plenty of churches and that's all that they do, but that's not us. We care about the things that we find that are very clear in the Bible. You can have your politics on other issues. That's fine. But don't pass that stuff out here unless you clear it through the leadership. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay. And I won't come to your house and sit down at dinner and start passing out to your kids all the things that I want them to do as well. All right. Just be kind of weird. I'd ask you first and then I would do it. All right. (laughs) Amen. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, And two, he said, pray for all those who are in authority. I just want you to think places of authority. Just think about seats that people sit in, places of authority. It's not just the person, but it's the person that occupies that seat because their choices 
and what they say and what they think matters. So when we pray for all those kings, the people that are in authority, we're praying because they hold power in their hands to make decisions and to do things. So, so regardless of your politics, you, you, we have to pray for people that sit in those places because it affects the lives of people. We have to pray. And we pray for righteousness. We pray for truth. We pray for, we pray for all of that. Uh, human history is full of great evil from the horrors of slavery to the pain of persecution. These things should not be, and yet they were. And I'm so thankful that Christians have been instrumental in shaping society through holding governments accountable. Aren't you? Christians did that. William Wilberforce, a committed Christian, was the force behind abolishing the slave trade in England. And he did that through the political process and prayer and being a man of God. In the U.S., more than half of the abolitionists during the time of slaves were devoted Christian pastors, well, well over half of them. In the 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr., who was a pastor, amen, he was a pastor, led the efforts against racial segregation and discrimination. All of them engaged the political process with prayer and some of them with civil disobedience, but they held governments accountable when there was evil in the land. And it was righteous for them to do so. And some of them lost their lives for doing it. And they were motivated by the Spirit of God. And it was right. Now, maybe that day will come to us. Maybe that day is upon us. I don't know. That's not what I'm saying. But if that day should come, I pray that we wouldn't shrink back from doing what God would call us to do because it's right and righteous. Some people are taking up the wrong cause at the wrong time. I pray that we would take up the right cause at the right time and we would push back clear evil as we seek to do what Jesus uh, tells us to do. Politics affect government, which shapes society, which influences culture, and that's why we care. That's why we care. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and I think that matters in every facet of society with every opportunity that we are given. So we must do what he said, let your light so shine among men that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That the things that we do and the things that we say and the way that we do it, all of that matters, doesn't it? But I don't want you to misunderstand me today because this is a lot and you're used to me opening the book of James. And we're going to go to the book of Philippians soon. But I don't want you to misunderstand me. I think it's important to talk about this, which we will for a few weeks. But there is only one true gospel that saves us from our sin. And it wasn't written in a courthouse in 1787. Our hope doesn't come from the White House and it doesn't ride in on the wings of Air Force One, amen. Our hope was born in a manger, raised in Israel, crucified on Calvary, raised to life 2,000 years ago. And our king doesn't sit behind a desk in the Oval Office and he's not up for re-election in November. So in your passion for politics, I want you to remember that there is a king of kings and he holds everyone accountable and he's gonna hold us accountable as well. And as we engage in whatever way that we are allowed to do so, I pray that we would do so as Christ followers and trust the Lord and love his word and be great representatives of him in this season. May we do that better now than we've ever, uh, than we've ever done it before. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Would you stand to your feet and let's pray. I think it's fitting. I want to pray for first our hearts and uh, I want to pray for our country. So let's do that today. Father, thank you for our church. Um, what we want is what you want. And I don't think I conveyed that perfectly or totally today. And so I, I ask you that you would uh, strengthen our hearts by grace and you would lead us uh, as we have faith in your word. And I pray that however we engage in the political process or just day-to-day -day politics of, of doing things that matter to people to affect lives, Father, I pray that we would do it um, in the name of Jesus with the nature of Jesus. And I ask, Lord, that in some of us have such passion in this area, Lord, I pray that it would not transcend and it would not be greater than the way that we live towards people and the mission that we have. It'd be a part of what we do, but it would not be our identity and it would not be greater than what we're most focused on. 
which is to see the lost saved and disciples made. And so help us to keep the right balance in this so that we would be your people doing the right thing at the right time. And I pray for all of our hearts, Lord, that we would uh, be able to steward this season so well, uh, even if others in our family and our friend circles don't. I pray that you would keep a guard over our mouth and that you would purify our hearts and that we would be a people of radical truth and a people of radical love. And somehow we would figure out how to do that by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, for our country, um, as we would pray for the nations of the earth, but I pray for the United States of America. I pray for every elected official and every place of authority that they occupy. Father, I pray for righteousness in our land so that the laws that are upheld, the bills that are signed, the politics that matter for the future, would affect not only great change for our country, but it would bless and it would strengthen and it would heal and it would cover and it would protect, especially the vulnerable. And I ask, Lord, that you would show us what that means and what that looks like. But I pray there would be a radical revival in this land and it would affect uh, political change all over the place. Not because we're politicized, not because that's the most important thing up front to us, but we would just see it affect a revival that would affect change from the streets to the skyscrapers. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, blow us away by what you do in these days. We just want to be a part of it in whatever way we can. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you today. If you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you in the gym.